Senator Ollier. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to give my no vote explanation. Uh, I'm 36 years old, and the reason I say that is because uh, exactly half of my lifetime, I have been eligible to vote. But my very first election, I was not able to vote in Michigan because, like many responsible 17-year-olds, I registered to vote in school, which is what they called a pre-registration, which they do not count as registering in person. My first election, I was in college. I was in upstate New York, and I could not vote absentee because I didn't register in person because the 1996 Michigan ID law, again, the 1996 voter ID law, did not consider my registration in person or valid for that situation. Today, we're just trying to do more things to disenfranchise young people and people who have all kinds of issues getting documentation to vote. I was eligible to vote. I had done all the things that I was supposed to do, and I was trying to vote. Uh, the state of New York wanted me to vote, as a matter of fact, and allowed college students the opportunity to register to vote and vote in New York as long as they didn't vote in their home state. So my first election, I voted in New York because New York wanted me to vote. Today, we're saying we don't want young people to vote. We don't want seniors to vote because we are, again, making it more difficult, not for people who don't have ID, but for people who may have an issue on election day. And we see that this is a routine and common practice, noting that 11,417 people had to file an affidavit because they didn't have their ID on election day. And so as we talk about what that would mean if all of them had to do a provisional ballot, that's a 15-fold increase of how many provisional ballots we had in the state. Because we only had 745 provisional ballots last year in the 2020 election, out of five and a half million ballots cast, with about a 27% count rate. Imagine that. Imagine all of your constituents thinking that they voted for someone, that they participated in the election, the qualified voter file says that they participated, and it didn't count. It didn't count at all. That's what these bills would do. That's what we're talking about, because voting with a provisional ballot is hard significantly more complicated than just voting. And it's harder on the staff. It takes more time. And time really matters to me. Because as a Detroiter, we routinely see long lines at the polling locations. We routinely have issues with people who don't understand how to use the electronic poll book. And now they'd be asked to, uh, under a high stress environment, say to someone, ah, this signature, we, uh, it's a complicated process that we don't need happening today on election day in these cramped environments when lines are already astronomically long. And you'd say, well, you know what? It'd be okay. If we gave them enough time to get it right, that would be fine. But we know that's not gonna happen. Uh, unlike every other member of this chamber, on election night, I left the hospital to go to the TCF center where they were saying, stop the count, where they were banging on the wall saying, stop the count. That was less than eight hours after the polls had closed. In some cases, four or five hours after the polls are closed. And in this, we're saying, hey, 11,000 more people need to have provisional ballots of which they can close and remedy within six days. But we know that in elections that matter, people are going to be saying the ballots need to be counted that day, within hours. And we know that's not going to happen. We know that's not going to happen in our large municipalities. 4,000 of, of these affidavits were done in Wayne County, not because that's an astronomical number for Wayne County that's commensurate to population, but that's where people live. In Oakland County, in Macomb, in our larger counties, this is going to cause huge problems just because it's going to take more time. And that's before you even get into what are the documents you need to bring, right? So I, I don't know if anyone else has ever lost an ID. But it is not a quick process to replace those, those documents, especially for young people and seniors who do not have all these backup documents, right? So for all of our, our seniors who are living with family and no longer living on their own, they don't have a utility bill in their name. They don't have a cable bill, a phone bill, or any of those kind of things. They had their one ID. And often that ID is no longer valid because they don't drive, right? My 98-year-old grand, year grandmother does not have a valid license anymore. She has a license has her picture on it, it has her name, it has her signature, but it's expired because she stopped driving a few years ago. 
and has had no need of a new one. All her medical cards, her social security documents, all of those things are still valid and still fine. But she would no longer be able to vote if she chose to vote in person. These are what we are expecting. This is the problem with these rules, these laws, these changes, that they do not support people who want to go out and vote. And then you've already talked, we've talked about the seniors, but young people similarly have an, incredible, an incredibly difficult challenge with these things. Your kid who's uh, couch surfing or moving home, they don't have a utility bill. They don't have a phone bill in their name. And many of them, if they had a phone bill or something like that from college, have not adjusted the address. So that address may not be the same as where they actually live and reside, where they're registered to vote, because they got their phone when they were in college. And they've never changed it because they don't get, re, you know, they don't get documents mailed to them. They just use email, right? Like they've all do paperless on some of these things that they've never ever had to adjust them. I know tons of people whose bank account is from when they were in college and the address that they use for that bank account is still that college address because they have paperless checking or any of those kind of things. This is an epidemic of how we look at, at changing in times. Young people don't, don't move their bank account numbers, they don't move those home addresses in the way that we expect or have thought about it from the past because it's not relevant for their life. So you say, hey, forgot your ID, you lost your ID, you can't use your college ID, you can't do some of those other things like you see in a number of other states. So they go back, they have six days to cure this situation and they don't have the information, they can't. So now we say, oh, you can't vote, your ballot's not counted. That's what these bills will do and it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to say to people who are registered to vote, who are eligible to vote, who want to vote, who want to participate, that you can't because, honestly, we just want to make it more difficult. We want to make it harder because that's what these bills do. They make lines longer on Election Day. They make it harder for poll workers to do the things. They make it more complicated, more convoluted, and it's not what we should be doing. It's not what we do in other situations, right? So for the past year, we've talked about making it easier to do other things. Getting, imagine getting a hunting permit. Imagine if we said we were gonna require all these things to get a hunting permit, to do any of those kind of things. We don't. We don't. We shouldn't make it harder for people to vote. We shouldn't make it this difficult. Thank you, Mr. President.